The gospel lesson for this morning comes from, it may seem strange, the night before Jesus died, what is called his final discourse. And the passage that we're reading is one that might seem strange in the season of Easter because we are still in Easter, although it feels like we've been in Lent for a very long time. We are still in one of the Sundays before Pentecost, between Pentecost and Easter, the great 50 days. So not only is this a passage that seems out of place for the Easter season since it's part of the passion narrative, but it's also one that we frequently hear read at funerals. But I want to get you to listen for what it says to us here and now at Epworth and the world today. This is the 14th chapter of John, the first 14 verses. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you I do not speak on my own, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will do all the works that I do, and in fact will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. These are the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. A couple moved to Florida when they retired, and wouldn't you know, before they really got settled in the house, before the house was unpacked, before they found a church, before they really even met their neighbors, the wife took a tumble down the stairs, broke her arm and her leg. Now, she was in the hospital a few days, and when she got home, her daughter, who lived quite a ways away, offered to fly down and help Dad take care of her. But her, the woman's husband said, no, 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 I'll take care of her myself. And he did. He worked mightily around the house, and a few weeks in, she noticed that he was getting a little bit short-tempered with her and a little bit fussy and a little bit quiet and sulking and folding his arms and kind of sighing a lot. And she said, what in the world is wrong? Have I done something to upset you? And he said, well, no, you haven't done anything. But he said, all these weeks I have done the laundry. I have folded it and put it away. I've done the vacuuming and the dusting. I've had to buy the food and bring it home and unload the car and put the groceries away and then I have to cook it. Then I have to clean up after dinner and do the dishes. I'm exhausted and you have yet to say a thing about all that I'm doing. She looked at him and smirked and said, yeah, housework is a thankless job, isn't it? We tend to look at the work of women inside the home as not as valuable as some of the other work that's done. And we tend to take for granted those people that we see as homemakers. But I believe in this, the gospel lesson and the epistle lesson this morning, Jesus is giving us a model for homemaking in two very different ways. Now, let's look at the gospel lesson from John. Jesus says, I'm going, and you know the way I'm going, and Thomas blurts out what the rest must have been thinking. We don't know what you're talking about, Lord. We don't know where you're going. How could we possibly know the way? And Jesus says to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. And that part that we read so often at funerals, in my father's house, there are many dwelling places. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And then that wonderful promise, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself so that where I am, you may also be. We tend to think of heaven as a place. We tend to think of heaven as a direction, usually up in the sky beyond the clouds. But heaven is the presence of God 
and the fullness of time when the resurrection happens for all of us, when we're together again with God. The place that Jesus is talking about is not a building or a house with rooms per se, but it's abiding in God as God abides in him. He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. They're not quite sure what he means. And Jesus said, well, if you can't believe me for what I say, believe me for what I've done, and you will do greater works than these. Hard for us to believe. And the part that seems not to ring true for us when Jesus says to them, if you abide in me, I will give you whatever you ask in my name. Some of us feel that those words haven't quite come true for us, especially in this time when we pray for this, this plague to end so that we can be together again when we see the numbers of people who are losing their lives to this and the hospital workers who are overwrought and the people in grocery stores trying to buy up all the toilet paper just because they're afraid and we think we've prayed God and you're not answering us. I don't think this is the prayer that Jesus is talking about. Jesus is asking us to pray that we will be part of God's kingdom and that the kingdom will become part of us that not only will we live with him eternally in heaven, but that he will live in us and through us here. And I think that is what the writer of the epistle meant this morning when talking about letting ourselves be built into a holy place, not a building made of stone, although we're called the living stones built on the cornerstone of Jesus, but allowing the kingdom to be put to work through us. Let's look for a minute at who this epistle is written to, the epistle of Peter. It's written to people who are living in the diaspora. For Jews, that's those who live outside of Jerusalem and outside of Palestine, outside of the holy land that God had promised them. But also you need to remember at this time that more and more people were coming to Christ without benefit of the Jewish background. And often these people were from different socioeconomic groups. There were slaves, there were free men, there were women. And some of the writings seem a little foreign to us. We talked about how it's not talking about slavery being a good thing, but to stand up for yourselves when you're serving as a slave, to stand up for your faith in Jesus Christ. I want to read you part of a, a passage written by Femi Perkins, who is one of the leading scholars in these epistles. And she talks about the people living at this time. And I want you to think about how it applies to us today. They did not even have separate buildings dedicated to worship. If they lived, whether as slaves, dependents, or wives, in a pagan household, they were surrounded by pagan religious art, even at home. Temples and shrines were everywhere. Christians had no art, no buildings, no sacred places. Everything took place within the assembled community of believers. That has a lot to say to us right now because we are, we're people who are used to being in a building. And every Sunday, or Saturday, as the case may be right now, when I come to Epworth, I come by way of Cockeysville Road, partly because I like avoiding at least two of the snail rail trains that always tend to stop me on my way to church, but also because I pass our original building, the building where I was baptized as a baby quite a few years ago. I like to go by there, and I like to look at that building because it was dear to me, and I remember being in there as a very small child. I remember being in Sunday school and being in worship and being at church picnics there. But the area changed, and so the area has become very industrialized. And if we had remained in that building, as beloved as it is to us, that beautiful stone edifice, if we had remained there, we probably would be part of a three- or four-point charge right now if the church had even been able to stay open. But 40 years ago, plus now, people had the foresight and the courage to move from a beloved structure, and they worshiped in a school building, in a cafeteria, until the time when this building was built. I know you miss it dearly, and I miss seeing you here, although I have more pictures. The attendance is up today because we have more pictures of the congregation, and even a few live people in the back this morning, which is good to see. We miss being together in this sense, but the building is not the church. When I came into ministry, I was ordained by Bishop Yackel, but before him, Bishop Fred Wirtz was the presiding bishop of the Baltimore then conference, now the Baltimore Washington conference. Every time we gathered, Bishop Wirtz would stand up and he would sing, I am the church, you are the church, we are the church together. All 
who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together. A church is not a building. A church is not a steeple. A church is not a resting place. A church is a people. Our small groups have continued to meet by Zoom. And I do ache for those who don't have computer access, who aren't part of one of these groups, although you can call in by telephone to them, and some people have been doing that as well. But we can't be together in person, but that is a way to free the church. So many people have commented on our worship services who aren't living anywhere near here. A woman in Virginia has written to me and said, I get so much out of your services every week because I'm unable to go to church where I am even in spite of the pandemic, this is someone who is homebound and never gets to church and is never visited by anyone from a church. And so we're finding new ways to reach people. Our children's messages, as I've said, Miss Debbie has gone above and beyond all expectations, is opening the doors for new little people to come to God in Jesus Christ. And especially on Mother's Day, it is so hard not to be together. One of the reasons that I sought to move back home to Baltimore County was to be close to my mom. Happy Mother's Day, Hattie. She's watching, I know. But I can't see her right now because it would put her health at risk and my dad's health at risk for me to be in their home. And so while we can't be together on Mother's Day, we can remember the call to be homemakers. Those who, we don't build the kingdom. Jesus came and established the kingdom. But we embody the kingdom, and it is built within us whenever we reach beyond these walls to reach others. Mother's Day is a tough day for so many women, which is why the prayer that we read, the litany that Reverend Bill Brown read with us, touches on so many things that impact people on this day. I know too well the pain of not being able to have children, and I always wanted to have kids. When I was a kid, I had dolls everywhere. And I always looked to the day of being a mother, and it wasn't possible for me. There are others who moms now live in the fullness of God's promise in that house with many rooms that Jesus has prepared for them. And I know it's painful when your mother's day is just memories, and you can't even talk to her on the phone anymore or hear her voice. For others, their mothers were not able to provide for them in a way that was good or wholesome or uplifting. And so it's still a painful day for so many women. But today we want to honor the mothering instinct that is in each of us, which is why we read that call to worship from Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, as one whom a mother comforts, so shall I comfort you. You shall be comforted in Jerusalem. That's the promise that was made so long ago through the prophet Isaiah, the promise that has come through in Jesus Christ the promise that lives in us as a living hope because we are living stones built into a spiritual house because once we were not a people, but now we are God's people. And Christ will live with us, and through us, he will be able to accomplish greater works than he did, works of healing and wholeness, works of lifting up people from poverty and oppression and sin and degradation into new and abundant life through him. I hope when you read this passage, it may remind you of a funeral that you've heard at some point, a sermon, or let not your hearts be troubled. The words that we're going to sing at the end of the service from one of my mom's favorite hymns, His Eyes on the Sparrow, which is one of my favorite hymns as well. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. That's the promise of our Lord Jesus Christ. In my Father's house, there are many dwelling places. There are many ways to be with God. We will be with God through the power of Jesus Christ at work in us. So until then, go find someone to mother because the world is desperately in need of your love, your grace, your homemaking skills. Maybe it seems like a thankless job, but the reward is pretty incredible in the world to come and in the world around us now. So go into the world to live abundantly, to share what has been shared with you, to love as you have been loved, to find someone who feels like a motherless child and know that in you they have a mother and a sister and a brother and a father and a friend. Because I am the church. You are the church. 
We are the church together, all who follow Jesus all around the world. Yes, we're the church together, not a building, not a steeple, not a resting place. We are the people of God, and that is cause to rejoice. Amen.